Well, we are wrapping up today a series uh, called Breakaway. And we began this series by saying that, you know, nobody wants to be like everybody else. We kind of want to want to be different. We want to be special. We want to kind of feel uh, separate from the crowd. We want to break away. And God says, that's really good news because I don't want you to be like everybody else. I don't want you to be like the people around you. And here's how he says it. He says, through the Apostle Paul, he says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Don't be like everybody else, but instead be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind, by the renovating of your mind. And so our premise for the series is this, that, that we all know like what the outcomes are in life. You got good outcomes, you got bad outcomes, you got you know outcomes in your marriage, outcomes in parenting, outcomes uh, in your career. We, we all kind of know those outcomes, and we know that behind those outcomes are decisions that we've made. We've made certain decisions that have resulted in those outcomes. We all know that, but what's not so obvious, what's not so intuitive a lot of times, is that behind those decisions are some beliefs. We have a set of core beliefs. There's, there's foundational beliefs behind everything that we do, everything that we decide. But the problem is, as we've said, like sometimes our fundamental beliefs are a mystery to us. We, we, don't, we don't really understand uh, what those are that's driving us. And that's why last week I asked you, like, hey, what are some of your, your foundational beliefs, your fundamental beliefs about money? <laughs> We're like, oh, I don't have enough? You know, is that a f- foundational belief? Like, like what, what is that? And, and we, we don't know, you know? It's like, who's got time to think about that? We got work to do, you know? We got, we got life to live. And yet God says, you know what, like, if you want different uh, outcomes, if you want to make some different decisions, you can't just simply live in this world. You got to step back sometime and you got to take a look and be like, what are, what are the things that are driving that? What, what's true? What's true? And how can I begin to make decisions based on what's true? Because as you stand back and you allow God to renew your mind to what is true, you make different kinds of decisions and you end up with different kinds of outcomes. So for the last few weeks, we've been kind of looking at some, some big ideas, some big truths, that if we were to embrace these big, broad beliefs, like they would change the kinds of decisions that we make in life. And I'm not going to review them right now. You can go online. Uh, you can pick up a CD, uh, catch up if you miss any of the weeks. But today, as we conclude the series, I want to talk to you about the one thing that I think is the biggest obstacle, maybe the biggest obstacle to breaking away. And it, it's a habit. It's a habit we all have. And this habit causes us to listen to a series like this or to hear information at church or, you know, in a Bible study or wherever. And you, you hear it and you go, yeah, 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 that's true. But it just kind of bounces off. And so like, that's why you've prayed a million prayers and your life hasn't changed. Or you've committed and, and you recommitted and you learned the words and you did the dance and you, maybe you, you got baptized even. And you, you're like, uh, there's still areas of my life, like Rob, I, I, I believe this, you know, these areas of my life just don't change though. You know, I'm trying, I'm trying to incorporate these beliefs that you've talked about. And I know I need to make some different decisions, different kinds of decisions. But as long as you're kind of caught in the loop of this habit that we're going to be talking about, all this stuff just kind of bounces off. And this morning, uh, I want to talk about it. It's something we all struggle with. And I think if you face up to what we're going to be talking about today, it's a huge step in, in beginning to live a breakaway life. It's a brand new way of, of thinking to set you up to break away. Now, let me talk about it this way. See, when you get up in the morning, or, or when I get up in the morning, and, and I'm a professional Christian, so I should know better. But, you know, it's like I get up in the morning, and, you know, it's like I, I'm like you. I wake up, I'm like, I'm not on a, a truth quest, Right? I don't turn to Rosalie and be like, hey, you know what? Let's get some more beliefs, some more truth, so that we can make better decisions, so we can make different outcomes, right? It's like, that's great to talk about in church, you know, and, and fun and all that, but, but I'm, we're not on a truth quest. Now, m- most of us are on an ego trip, but we're not on a truth quest. We're on a happiness quest, right? I, I, uh, truth is great, but really I want to be happy. You know, that's what I'm after. I'll even trade truth for happiness because, you know, there's some truth might make me unhappy. So I'd rather live in this fantasy world and be happy than to have all this truth and be unhappy because I want to be happy. And basically, like the decisions we make aren't based on what's true and what's right. It's really kind of based on what makes me happy. That's why, that's why you don't exercise and you eat too much, right? It's like we love to eat, so we eat and eat and eat and eat and eat, you know, and, and even though we know it's not good for us, it makes us happy. And then we realize, oh, I'm not happy anymore because look at me, you know? So like we, we turn around, we diet, 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 you know, and we exercise, exercise, get workout, you know, get healthier, healthier, and that makes us happy. 
Well, which is it, you know? Well, this is whatever makes me happy. And I'm kind of happy becoming a slob. Now I'm happy becoming healthy. You know, probably later I'm liable to be happy you know, going the other way. Or, you know, you like you spend your money, you spend yourself almost into financial ruin and you enjoy it. It's like, oh, I love to shop, you know, go online, go to the mall, just shop, shop, shop. It just takes the edge off, you know. I want to buy more and more and more. I want to drive newer, faster, better. And so you spend money because it makes you happy, not because it makes any sense. And then all of a sudden you realize, whew, we're in trouble, you know, we're in too much debt. And so you start to work your way out of debt and you do it with a smile on your face. You know, we're so happy we're getting out of debt. Or, or if you used to smoke, you know about this. Like, oh, I love that I smoke, and now, they, now I love the fact that I don't smoke. Well, what happened? Well, it's basically we're not on a truth quest. We're on a happiness quest. Whatever makes me happy, that basically drives my decisions. Or kind of like those little, remember those little toy locomotives or the little cars that you would uh, have batteries in them and you'd turn them on, and they would go a certain direction until they hit a wall, boom, and then they'd stop and they'd go a different direction. We're kind of like that, you know, like, the, like a human Roomba. You know, we, we go, I head this way, boom, you know, no, I'm, this makes me happy now. Now I'm going to head this way, this makes me happy. And people are like, well, you're not, even, you're not even consistent. You're contradicting yourself. You know, it's like I'm not trying to be consistent. I'm trying to be happy. You know, I'm trying to, I don't want, I'm not worried about getting truth in my life. I just want to do what I want to do. And you know what? That's not going to change. Okay? The end of the sermon is not like, well, here's how to change that. That's not going to change. You're that way. I'm that way. But here's the problem. See, we make decisions based on what do we want to do. That's kind of how we live. That's how we make decisions. But the problem is, and this is where it gets complicated, we, we make decisions based on what we want and what makes me happy. And then we go, oh, you know, because we're not nine years old anymore. We're like, I've got to go searching for some reasons to substantiate these decisions. I gotta go find some reasons to kind of back it up. In other words, we don't do like research and, and then make decisions. We make decisions based on what makes us happy. It's been said that every decision is an emotional decision. I think that's really true, right? Like every decision, there's there's some emotional part of that. So we make decisions based on what do I want to do? And because we're not nine, we can't just say to people, well, because I wanted it, right? You know, why'd you buy that? I wanted it. You know, why, why'd you call her? Well, I wanted to. No, we can't do that, so we make decisions. And then we go look for reasons that aren't really the reasons to substantiate our decisions. We bring those reasons back, we put them in front of our decisions. So when people ask us, like, why? We're like, well, here are these reasons that aren't really the reason. I'll give you some examples of this. These are reasons you'll never hear because people don't say these out loud, right? You never say these out loud. They're not the real reason. But it's like, um, because my friend bought one. Because my friend bought one. You know, why'd you, why'd you buy that? Well, my friend bought one. No, we don't say that. We're like, oh, well, I really needed it. You know, I needed a, a new one or that. No, it's because my friend bought one. Or well, because he's rich. <laughs> you know, why are you dating him? Oh, well, because he's rich. <laughs> like, we don't say that at all. He's really nice. He's got a great personality. He's a foot shorter than you. Yeah, but he's really, he's caring, you know? <laughs> it's like, no, it's because he's rich. Here's another one. I want to look like somebody else. Well, why are you dressed that way? Why are you wearing that? Well, I want to look like somebody else. We don't say that. We're like, well, you know, it's so comfortable, you know, and it's kind of the fashion, and I got a deal. No, it's like, I, we want to look like somebody, but we can't say that, so we got to come up with this reason, set it out there in front. Some more of these, you heard these, like, we moved in together, why? Why? To save money, right? We moved in together for financial reasons. No, you didn't, you know, that's not why you moved in together. Just say it, why, why'd you move in? Well, I can't say that. Well, you know, why say anything? Just because I wanted to. It was really interesting. Like you talk to, talk to couples that move in together and you drill past all that financial stuff. It's always, always the, the reason the guy moved in is different than the reason the girl moved in with the, the guy. It's every single time. And neither of them will say why, so they come up with a third reason. That's not a reason. For financial reasons. Right? Even, and nobody believes it. You know? Like nobody believes it. But even though nobody believes it, after a while they start to believe it. Here's another one. I got this new car because it's safe. Because I, I need a safe car, you know? Oh, so you got this big black pimped out Hummer because it's safe? Yeah, it's safe, you know? Why'd you get black? Well, it's harder to see so people won't run into it, you know? It's like, like yeah, I got this safe car. It's a nice safe car, big, you know, safe, safe car. It's like, what's that, son? You want to borrow my safe car? No, no, no. You, you, you drive your, you know, beat up car until you learn to drive safe, and then you can drive dad's safe car, right? It's like, no, it's like, I want you to be safe, but I don't want you to be that safe. See, you, that's why you bought it. You know why you bought it, because you wanted it. You wanted it. I'll tell you one on myself. 
uh, about three years ago or so, our, we had an outdoor pool kind of that we had to take down every year, and it had rusted through the poles and stuff. We had to get a new one. So we went to the pool store, and I got the biggest outdoor pool that you can get, like this big pool that you can just like, leave up year-round. And so we got this pool, and people would come over and be like, oh, that's a big pool. Yeah, that's a big, yeah, that's the biggest pool. They you know, that's a, that's a big pool. And I start to get, get a little you know, self-conscious about it. People are like, oh, that's a big pool. And so I'm like, you know, so what did I do? Like, oh, I'm going to go find a reason, you know, put it out in front. And I got it. You know, it's a big pool. Yeah, well, we like to entertain. <laughs> we like to entertain, you know. We could have the youth group over, you know. Uh, oh, okay. So you bought the pool for Jesus, right? <laughs> and I was like, uh, so you bought the pool. Yeah, that's right. We, we bought the big pool for Jesus. Right? That's, that's why we got a big pool. That's not why we got a big pool. We got a big pool because I wanted a big pool, right? But don't we all do this? You know, we, we kind of feel compelled to come up with a reason and nobody believes it, you know, and nobody walks away going, oh, the spars are so godly, you know, they got the big boy. And I was like, no, nobody believes that. But we start to believe those silly stories and we deceive ourselves. That's really dangerous. Because isn't this true? Like you can convince yourself of just about anything. You can convince yourself of just about anything. Like so can I. Like you are the best salesperson to yourself. You can talk yourself into just about any decision that you want. You know, you can sell yourself, convince yourself of just about anything. That's why the first rule of people uh, in recovery will tell you, the very first rule is you got to be like brutally honest. You know, you ruthless honesty, rigorous honesty to ourselves and to others. Like that is the first rule of recovery. If you want to get better, like the first step is to make progress, to make better decisions, avoid unnecessary regret. You got to tell yourself the truth. Got to be rigorously honest. Got to tell yourself the truth, even if the truth makes you feel bad about yourself. And until we're willing to face and acknowledge the real reasons behind our decisions, it's real difficult for God and for God's truth to begin to renew our minds. As long as you're lying to yourself, you know, about why you do what you do, like the truth just kind of bounces off, you know, and, and God comes up to us or, you know, we start to feel convicted or somebody preaches a sermon. We throw out all these reasons that aren't really reasons. It's very difficult for God to kind of get us where we need to be if we won't acknowledge where we really are. Now, if there's any good news to this, it's this. is that basically your propensity and my propensity for self-deceit is really not your fault. You were, you were born with this. It starts at an early age. There's a video that was going around uh, a little bit ago that just kind of demonstrates this real vividly. Let's just take a look at this real quick. No. Who no. did this, TJ? No, 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 no. Did, did you do this? No. Huh? No. You didn't do this, TJ. Yes, you did. Who got to them cupcakes, TJ? No. Did you do it? No. But you did. You didn't good. do this? No. You did good. You sure? I... This is your last chance. No. Are you sure? Did you do it? No. Y yes. So you didn't oh, get push this chair over here, climb on there, and get them cupcakes. No. <laughs> I think TJ actually believes that, right? You know, it's like you, we deceive others and we deceive ourselves. You know, and nobody has to sit down with a little kid and say, "Okay, here's how you deceive yourself." You know, this is oh, let's take some time to talk about this. It just happens, right? Like anytime you've argued with one of your kids and they just start throwing out all these reasons, you're like, that's not the reason you did that. And they're like, oh no, there's, they're just churning out all these reasons. We're masters at self-deceit. Started in the Garden of Eden. You know, Adam, Adam, what have you done? Well, she, 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 she. Well, you know, Adam's going like, that's not really why I ate that. But, you know, I got to have an excuse. Can't just say, well, I wanted to. Can't say that. From the very beginning, we've been trying to deceive God and deceive the people around us and deceive ourselves. And the prophet Jeremiah talks about this in his book. Um, we're just going to take a look at one verse this morning. It's in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 17, 9. And God, through Jeremiah, states this truth. And, and we know from personal experience just how true this is. Okay, Jeremiah 17, 9 says this. He says, the heart is deceitful above all things. Above, really? That's, that's pretty extreme, right? The heart is deceit. Like, yeah, the heart, your heart, my heart, your mama's heart. <laughs> Not my mama's heart. No. Yeah, uh, your ma uh, Jeremiah's heart, your pastor's heart, you know? Everybody's heart is deceitful. Now, you know, there, there's a difference between dishonest and deceitful, right? 
dishonest is just straight up not honest. You know, it's just like, it's really easy to catch, you know, the dishonesty. But deceitful kind of implies an agenda. Like there's, there's this mix of, of truth and half-truth and, and, and right-out lies. And we just kind of mix that all together. And, and it's harder to catch. See, if our hearts just flat out lied to us all the time, you know, that'd be pretty easy to spot. But deceitful, you know, that's different. It's, it's more difficult to detect. Can't see that in the mirror all, all the time. The heart is deceitful above all things. And check this out. And beyond cure. Beyond, there's no cure. There's no pill. There's no book. There's no prayer. There's no, there's no seminar. There's no conference. There's no song. There's no, there's no commitment that at the end of it, like your heart is no longer deceitful. The heart is deceitful, which means you can't trust your heart. And I can't trust my heart. You know, somebody says to you like, oh, you know, what's your heart telling you? Just, just go with your heart. You're like, forget that, you know? Like, no, you can't trust. Your heart can convince you of just about anything. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Not a great question. Like, I love that because there's so many times, like, I've asked myself that. Like, there's something God says, well, don't do that. And here's something I know, like, could wreak havoc in my relationships. And, and, I, and I, if I get caught, I, and they get in trouble. And, you know, it just leads to regret and shame and guilt. And, and I feel like a hypocrite. And then I do it anyway. Like, what, what's that about? Like, how do you explain that? Why in the world would we do something that not only do we know is wrong, but it's actually harmful? We're going to regret it later. We've done it in the past. We've told God 87 different times, like, oh, God, you know, I'll never do it again. And then we just go and we do it again. Like, who can understand that, Jeremiah says? You can't understand it. The heart is incredibly deceitful, can't be trusted, and there's no cure, which means there's nothing you can do or I can do that can change our heart. Can you manage the disease? Yeah, you can manage it. Can you cure it? Uh-uh. It never goes away. I will always have the ability and the propensity to lie to myself and to act on my lies and to, to defend my lies and to get all these excuses and miss what God wants to do in my life. That, that's just always going to be there. But when you're willing to take a long, hard look at what's true, to rip away the lies and rip away the deceit and go, okay, what's really going on here? Like, when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Somebody famous said that once, right? You, you can't be set free as long as you're in the habit of lying to yourself. See, when you and I are really willing to drill down to like, what's, what is it that I, I really believe, you know? What's, what's behind all the, the, the lies that I've adopted and the reasons I've hidden behind? Then you're on the verge of being set free. That's why the verse that we've been looking at every week in this series is just so powerful. Romans 12, 2. I'll show you the whole verse this time. It's amazing. Here's the first part. We've seen this. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then there's this huge word, huge word next. Then, and only then, will you be able to test and approve God's will, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Here's what that means. That, you know, like, that means that once you begin that process of asking, like, what do I, what do I believe is true? You know, and what do I believe that's not true? What, what are the lies? You know, what are the excuses I, I, I'm using? When you begin that process of, of renovating your belief system, then you'll have the ability to, uh, to test and approve what God's will is. Until you do that, you'll never be able to approve God's will. You'll hear it, or somebody will preaches, will, will teach it, you know, your conscience will speak to you, and you'll be like, I know, I know, I know, but I'm not going to do it. See, until you're willing to look long and hard into the mirror of your soul and to strip away the excuses, then you're a candidate for, for God's grace to move you to where he wants you to be. As long as you're lying to yourself, you'll never be able to test and approve God's will. God's will is just going to seem so extreme and so outlandish and so culturally irrelevant. It's so much easier to make the transition from my will to your will to God's will once you've renewed your mind and renovated your thinking and been honest with yourself. Even if you decide, like, you know what, I'm not going to do anything different. I'm not going to do anything different. I'll admit to myself, okay, these are reasons. They're not really the reasons. You know, I'll face the truth. I just made those reasons up. But the bottom line is I'm just going to do what I want to do, right? Well, congratulations. Congratulations. Now you know where you are. Congratulations, now you finally started telling yourself the truth. 
That's huge progress, right? And now you're candidates for God's grace and God's activity in your life. See, by discovering where we are, it's easier for God to move us to where we need to be and where he wants us to be. As we wrap up this morning, I want to give you three questions to begin to ask yourself. And these are tough questions. They're, they're difficult. They're in your version notes if you're on that, or you can just jot these down. But these are kind of mirror questions, okay? They help you look in the mirror of your soul. These are breakaway questions to help you figure out where you are so you can know where you need to go. And here's the first question. Why am I doing this really? Okay, let's just say that together out loud. Ready? Why am I doing this really? Yeah, and you got to add the really in there because we have this tendency to deceive ourselves. Why am I doing this really? Why, why am I avoiding them really? Why am I postponing this really? Why am I making excuses really? Why did I say yes really? Why did I choose to buy that, really? Why won't I get help, really? Are you willing to tell yourself the truth? That's brutal. It's terrifying. But it's clarifying. And it's liberating. Why am I doing this, really? Second question. If someone in my circumstances came to me for advice, what course of action would I recommend? <laughs> well, it certainly wouldn't, certainly wouldn't be the one I'm planning to do, right? Now you know, right? I'm not trying to get you to do something. I just want you to discover why you're doing it. Because only then are you a candidate for God to move you. So if somebody came up to you and says, you know, here's what I'm thinking about doing. You know, I'm thinking about leaving or I'm thinking about changing this or I'm thinking about moving. I'm thinking about buying. I'm thinking about this job. I'm thinking about going here or doing that. Like, what would you tell them? Now you know. Third question goes back to something we talked about a few years ago uh, for several weeks, and it's just this. In light of my current circumstances, in light of my past experience, my, my, my current circumstances, and my future hopes and dreams, in light of all of that, like, what's the wise thing for me to do? Not, not for somebody else, not what are, is everybody else going to do. What's the wise thing for me to do? Like, you know, I'm at least going to acknowledge what the wise thing is, even if I don't do it. I may do the wrong thing, but I'm not going to try to pretend it's the right thing. I, I'm going to do it knowing why I did it. I'm not going to do, I, I, I may do the dumb thing, but I'm not going to pretend it's the, the wise thing, you know? I, I'm, I'm going to do the dumb thing. I'm, I, I'm not going to pretend it's the smart thing. I, I, I'm not going to pretend it's the moral thing when I know in my heart it's the immoral thing. I'm just going to be honest. I'm going to look in the mirror, and I'm going to say, I've decided to do something that's unwise, that, that you know, I wouldn't recommend anybody else do, and I'm just doing it because I want to. Hey, congratulations, like that's progress right there. And if those three questions kind of make you squirm, like you've discovered something about yourself, now you know you've been deceiving yourself. I'm telling you, for most of us, this is huge progress. Like this is, this is a, uh, you're on a verge of a breakthrough because if you refuse to cover up the mirror, you refuse to play games with yourself, you're a candidate for God to begin to break through your life because he's all about truth and he's all about renovation. And now you know where you are and you have a better idea of where he wants you to be. And God's going like, well, I want to get involved. I want to get involved, but you got to discover where you are and who you are. And you got you to quit lying to yourself. Andy Stanley came up with, uh, I thought it was kind of a uh, funny deal. He, he says, you know what? We should start something called uh, DA. You know, you got NA and you got AA. We should start something called DA, uh, Deceivaholics for Deceivaholics, right? And we could be like the duh group. <laughs> like, duh, now I know, right? Deceivaholics, right? Because uh, our hearts are deceitful above all things. And there's no cure. And you see, your Heavenly Father wants to bring about different outcomes. That's what Scripture is all about, right? That's what the gospel is all about. Like, God has intersected with our lives, and He wants to bring about change. But the habit, maybe above every other habit, that could short-circuit this from happening is our propensity to, uh, to have all these uh, reasons uh, to lie, to cover up, and, and justify what we do, and to lose track of, of who we are and, and where we are. And my heart's desire for you is that we, we, you quit deceiving yourself. Right? My heart's desire is that we would stare long and hard in the mirror and just say, God, even if I do the wrong thing, I don't want to deceive myself. I want to strip away all the lies. I want to strip away all the all the, the deceit, you know, because that's going to bring me so close to the truth that's going to set me free. 
So close to being able to say, I approve and I understand God's will for my life. Would you stand with me now for closing prayer? God, this morning as we wrap up this series, this is kind of uncomfortable for a lot of us because some of us have been living behind these reasons and what we put out there, and we know it's not the real reason. You know, we know in our hearts how we justify it. And Father, just as we close this morning, would you please just, in your grace and your mercy, allow this to be kind of a breakthrough moment for us. For us to be honest with ourselves and honest with you. Quit making excuses. And just kind of break that pattern that we have of allowing our, our deceitful, dishonest heart to guide us and lead us and mislead us. Give us the courage to look long and hard and allow you to transform and to renovate our thinking and to bring about outcomes that you desire for us. Father, we pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. See you all next week.